For life to work right, relationships need to work right. It's the way God made us. God has gone to great lengths to relate to us, so we have potential to build incredible relationships with one another. Gaining God's perspective will give us greater purpose, bring peace in the midst of conflict, and help us to restore relationships. God made us to be relatable. Hey, Mountain. I hope you've been really getting a lot out of this series this summer that we called Relatable. I think one thing we've all come to appreciate is just how significant relationships really are in our lives, right? I mean, when relationships are going well, when they're healthy and God-honoring and life-giving, man, our whole life seems like it's going well, right? But alternatively, if we have relationships that kind of suck the life out of us, they're toxic and not very healthy, man, it feels like all of life pretty much is miserable. And uh, aren't you glad that the Bible has so much to teach us about relationships, all coming from our relational God who, who loves us and establishes relationship with us and then means to fill us with enough of his own love and self that we spill over onto others. And that, my friend, is what can make you and me relatable. I think you've probably figured out by now that we're really not talking about some kind of shallow self-help stuff about relationships. You know, it, this is not the stuff you're going to find on tabloids at the grocery store, right? We're, we're digging deeply into God's Word and letting the truth of God penetrate our lives so it changes us. And then we bring something different to all of our relationships because of God in our life. That's the key to relationships. And we're wrapping up this series this weekend and we're going to talk about something that, to be honest, I struggle with. I'll bet you do too. And it's also something that we all really long for. Are you curious what I'm talking about? I'm talking about peace. Peace in relationships, especially where there's conflict. I'll be honest with you. It's pretty easy for me to talk about peace where I am right now, right? I mean, I'm, I'm in my favorite place on the whole planet with the people I love the most. I'm, in, I'm at the cabin in, in Minnesota, the place where I come every year for vacation. It's also kind of a study break and a chance to recharge and reconnect with my family and God. And uh, it's been awesome. It's coming to an end, but it's been really great. And this is a place I just sense God's peace. My Uncle Calvin has a cabin next door, and he always used to say, this is a place where the pines whisper peace. And he's right. You know, I love to lie back in the hammock, and I look at the pine trees kind of swaying against the sky, and they remind me of like the fingers of God reaching down just to say, I got this. There's peace there, you know. I was out on the lake, which is itself so calming and peaceful, in the kayak, and, and there was a bald eagle, you know, circling overhead, and there was a family of loons coming right by and uh, singing their song. You know, when I'm back in Maryland, you loony people drive me crazy and it create all kinds of stress. You know who you are. But up here, the loonies, uh, they're actually very, very peaceful. I, I hope that you also find some, some peace uh, this summer, that you get to go to a place that really just brings a lot of peace for you. I know for some of you that'll be, you're going to go down the ocean, right, and uh, do the thing that you've been doing for years down there. And uh, maybe for some of you, it's so stinking hot in Maryland and unbearable, you're just going to have a staycation and, and go inside and turn on the air conditioning, right, and eat some whole life challenge Doritos or something. But Wherever you go, I really do hope that you find a sense of, of peace because heaven knows there's so much strife and conflict and tension in the world. Isn't that true? I mean, if you could spin a globe and then just put your finger down anywhere you want to, you're going to be pointing to a place where there's conflict and ethnic strife and, and tension between nations and warring and all kinds of difficulty. But you don't need to point to a globe, right? You can point to yourself or the person on either side of you, and you're also pointing to a person who needs to understand how to have peace in the midst of relationships. 
Maybe you heard the one about the old couple. They've been married 65 years and they never had an argument, never had any conflict in their marriage. Finally, one of the grandkids says, hey, grandpa, how is it that you and grandma never fight or argue at all? And he says, well, you know, it goes back to our wedding night. Uh, we were leaving the church after the wedding and um, we hadn't gotten any more than a mile and the old horse that was pulling the buggy started to buck and act up. So I cautioned that horse and I gave it a little switch and your grandmother said, that's strike one. We went a little bit further and that horse acted up again and your grandma, she said, that's strike two. And when that horse acted up a third time, she reached out, got my shotgun, put it right at the head of that horse and killed it dead right on the spot. I was so shocked. I said, I said, what was that all about? I started to complain and she just looked at me and she said, that's strike one. And we haven't had an argument since. <laughs> so that's one way to bring about the peace, right? I wonder... What is it that really gets your goat? What is it that gets under your skin that just fries you, that just sort of makes your hair stand up and smoke come out your ears? What really chaps your buns? <laughs> the question is not really what gets us all riled up because so many things do and there's so many causes for conflict. The question is, what do you do when it happens? What do you do when it happens? Let me let you in on a little secret that you probably already know the answer to, and that is that peace is never found in a place at all. It's always only found in a person, and his name is Jesus. Peace comes from God. The Bible has that great Hebrew word shalom. You've probably heard it, and sometimes we think it's like a casual howdy in, in Hebrew or something, like a greeting or something, but it's not. It's a deeply profound word packed with meaning. It means a, a deep-seated sense of contentment and wholeness and well-being, where my cup is full, life is good, and all is well with the world. I have peace and harmony with God and with other people. That sense of salvation is what we long for the most, shalom. And this is what God offers us. So one day Jesus was with his disciples and they were all upset and angry with each other and afraid and anxious and worried. And that's when he said in John 14, 27, my peace I give to you. Jesus gives us shalom, that deep-seated sense of well-being. It comes from God. And you know, just as Jesus gave that peace to his disciples back then, he wants to give it to us today. He wants to give you peace so that you can have it in your heart. That's what Paul is talking about in Philippians 4 when he says, don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. And then he says, and the peace of God will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. He calls it the peace that passes understanding. It won't make sense to most people. They'll say, well, you've got all those angry people in your life. You've got all that anxiousness. You've got all that awful stuff going on. Shouldn't you be upset? And you can say, no, I have a sense of peace even in the midst of conflict. Why? Because the peace that comes from God is stronger than any conflict. So here's what we want to realize today, and that is that God doesn't just offer peace to you and me so that we can enjoy it and, and soak it up, but he offers it to us so we can share it with others. All of God's gifts that he gives to us are meant to be shared, and peace is no different. I give you my peace, and now he says in Matthew 5, 9 in the Beatitudes, Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, those who bring peace, because they are the children of God. You want to act like you belong to God? Be a person who brings peace, who brings peace into the boardroom, who brings peace into the living room, into the bedroom, into every conversation and place you go. Be a person who brings and makes peace. In fact, this is something we see all over Scripture. I mean, I could give you a hundred Scriptures if you want them. I love Hebrews 12 that says, work at living in peace with God everyone. Work at it. Apparently, peace is not always easy, right? Does anybody identify with that? That sometimes it takes a little effort. Are you really working at being someone who brings peace out of conflict? 
What it says in Romans 12, 16 is live in harmony with one another. Verse 14 and 17 says, when someone insults you and just pushes your buttons, don't curse them, bless them, and do not repay evil for evil. And then verse 18 says, as much as it depends on you, do everything you possibly can to live in peace with everyone. And I love 2 Corinthians 13, 11. Look at this. It says, grow to maturity. And it links peace with that. It says, encourage each other and live in harmony and peace. And then the God of love will give you even more peace. Do you hear what it's saying? It's saying mature people are people who bring peace into conflict situations. I think this is pretty important for us. You know why? Because this passage is telling us that some of us need to grow up. Peace bringing is a matter of maturity. And I think sometimes we give ourselves a pass on this. We give ourselves an easy out. We're like, oh, it's just the way I am. Or my family's always that way. Or it was their fault. Or do you see what she said? Or he pushed my buttons and we just kind of discount it. But the Bible says, if you're the kind of person where conflict follows you around, instead of blaming everyone else, it's time for you and me to look in the mirror and it's time to grow up. Jesus says, my peace I give to you, now share it with others. Be a peacemaker, be a child of God. The best way I know to illustrate this and bring it to life is to go back and remind you about our buckets, right? Here's the buckets. There's two buckets and three truths, okay? Truth number one, everybody's got two buckets. Everyone's got the same two buckets, a red bucket, and a blue bucket, okay? In the red bucket, gasoline. And in the blue bucket, water. That's the first truth. The second truth is this. Everywhere you go, there's a fire, okay? It might be a little fire. It might just be a barely smoldering ember. It might be a fire like this one, or it might be a raging forest fire. But here's the fact. Everywhere you go, every conversation you enter, every room you walk into, every Facebook thread that you hop into, every boardroom, every, whether it's global leaders or a family sitting around the fire chatting, there's a fire. And the third truth is this, you get to decide which bucket you're gonna pour on the fire. So I don't think I have to explain to you what happens when you pour the red bucket full of gas on the fire, right? Can everybody say, woof, <laughs> right? So uh, dad comes home from work. He's had a pretty tough day, but he has no idea the backstory of what's been going on at home with her. She's got two little kids, and it's been an awful day. The, the laundry machine went up, and the dog is puking on the carpet, and she can't clean the diapers, and, and little, little Johnny stole Bella's crayon, so she punched him in the nose, and then he tore her dress, and they're clawing at each other, so mom has to break it up, and she runs across the floor, and she stubs her toe on the garbage, golf clubs that she told her husband four times, will you please move the golf clubs? He didn't move the golf clubs. She falls into a heap. She's just sitting there on a fl in the floor holding on to her thumb, and he comes in. He's had a terrible day. He didn't get the sale. His boss balled him out. Traffic was a mess. Finances are tight. His mother's in the hospital. He just wants to come home, find some peace and quiet, and get a good meal. Instead, he comes in, and kids are screaming. She's crying. There's no supper anywhere in sight. Can I tell you something you already know? There's a fire there, folks. There's a fire. And here's the question. Which bucket are they going to reach for? What if it was you? Which bucket would you reach for in that moment? So what you decide about which bucket you bring to the fire matters a lot, doesn't it? You can't be a peacemaker and have your default bucket be the red one, right? You know what happens when you pour gas on a fire. There's not real gas in here. I wouldn't be this close because it's too dangerous. It just explodes and makes everything worse, right? What makes the sound when you, when you pour the gas on? Woof! And sometimes that's the sounds that happen in our homes. But you also know the sound, don't you, when you, when you pour some water on a fire. You hear that sound? Ah, it's just a calming, cooling effect. It just has such a relaxing, gentling effect. Which bucket are you bringing to the fire? We all know the correct answer to this, right? We know that the answer is, oh, well, we're gonna reach for the blue bucket, right? And that's the intellectual answer we give sometimes, but you know, 
When our emotions get all jacked up and out of control, that's when it really becomes a maturity issue and a decision that we've got to make that's very difficult. And I don't know if we can make it without God's help. Blessed are the blue bucket people, Jesus says, because they're the ones who are not acting childish, but acting like a child of God. In the book of Proverbs, it says, a gentle answer turns away wrath and anger. Can you hear that? That's a peacemaker. But it says, a harsh word stirs up and anger and makes tempers flare. Woof. And there it is. And you get to decide. The red bucket is filled with defensiveness. People who are always blaming everyone else for the problems. People who power up and get angry in a hurry. But the blue bucket, the blue bucket has listening and patience some gentleness and kindness and self-control. All the fruit of the Spirit is found in the blue bucket. So let me ask you a question. What's your go-to bucket (laughs) when things get kind of hot and tense? What's your go-to default bucket? Again, it's pretty easy to say we're going to reach for the blue bucket until things get really riled. I mean, what riles you up? That's when you've got to think, God, in those moments, help me not to reach for the red bucket. When the fire is actually hot, then help me reach for the blue bucket. I mean, you know, President Trump is the best president we've ever had. President Trump is the worst thing that humanity's ever seen. Uh, black lives matter. All lives matter. You know, matter matters. We need to legalize pot. We need prayer in school. We, uh, what, we, we need, what, what riles you up? Am I getting anybody excited yet? You know, when you really kind of want to just say, wait a second, that's so stupid. I'm so angry. Those are the moments. Those are the moments where Jesus says, ah, now... Blessed are you if you reach for the blue bucket. We can do this, friends. It's time to grow up and be peacemakers. Now, here's one more truth. And that is that sometimes you can bring all the blue buckets you want. And sometimes something has happened to you that hurts so bad it doesn't just automatically go away. Jesus has a solution for that, too. Last fall, when we were getting ready to launch our Unleash Love initiative, right, we had this special event. It was a night for staff and elders and our families, a way of kind of dedicating ourselves to God first and to just really prepare our hearts for what God would have for us. And uh, as part of that evening, we had planned a foot washing service. Foot washing is something Jesus did as a sign of humility and Uh, We just felt God was inviting us to do that in our own community, to invite reconciliation and humility into our own community. And as we were getting ready to do that activity, I felt God was telling me something. So there was another, um, another man on our leadership team. We had kind of bumped heads a little bit a a while ago and, and had kind of crossed hairs. And I was aware there was a bit of a rift, not bad, but our relationship wasn't whole, you know? And I felt like God was saying to me in a real clear way, go wash that guy's feet. I wish I could tell you that that's exactly what I did, but I didn't. Um, We started into the exercise and someone else is right in front of me and I ended up kind of working with that person and then another and I kept watching, think, well, I'll get around to it. Maybe I'll get down there. And, And then after a while, I put on his shoes and he walked away and I felt really convicted that I'd missed the moment, a God nudge, you know. Um, Now later, God opened up another opportunity and we had a great conversation and made the relationship right again. But it made me really think about how God is always nudging us toward reconciliation. He's always pushing us in the direction of shalom, isn't he? When there's a rupture in relationship, whenever we have unforgiveness in our heart towards someone, God is always speaking to us and encouraging us to move toward them with a spirit of forgiveness. And I I just got to believe that even right now, someone is being nudged by God because there's an offense that you have. There's a hurt that you're holding. Some wrong that has happened to you that you're really just holding on to. And what needs to happen 
for shalom to happen and peace to flow is forgiveness. Let's get practical. How do we forgive? As peacemakers, how do we forgive? I want to tell you about the cool word in the New Testament, Greek language for forgiveness. It's the word aphiemi. Aphiemi. It's a great word. And basically, boiled down, the word means to let go. To let go go. If a prisoner is in jail and they decide to set him free and open the cage, that's a fee of me. He's released. If someone owes you money and you say, da, you don't have to pay. You let him off the hook. That's the word in the Bible, a fee of me. It's used when someone had a legal obligation and you didn't hold them to it. The judge said, no, you can go free. They're released. It's a fee of me. It's a cool word, isn't it? It's the same word that's used for divorce. When a husband puts a wife or a wife separates herself from her husband. Aphiomi. When Jesus called his disciples, he said, um, follow me. And the Bible says they dropped their nets and left them and followed Jesus. That's the word again, aphiomi. And then when God sees us and our sin, he doesn't hold those sins close to his heart. The Bible says he casts them as far as the east is from the west. He separates us from our sin through Jesus Christ. That's the word aphiomi. And that's the word Jesus uses when he says that someone has really hurt you, when they've wronged you, when there's an offense, when there's some sin against you that you don't know if you're going to be able to let go of. Jesus says you know what you need to do, right? Afia me. Let it go. Now, if you're like me, sometimes you're like, okay, fine. I'll forgive. I'll let it go. And we take it and we just say, all right, fine. And we forgive. But we really didn't let it go. Sometimes we forgive with strings attached, don't we? Why do we do that? Well, that way we can pull it up again. That way we can bring it right back up at the right moment. In the middle of an argument, we can use it as ammunition. We can pretend we forgave, but say, you remember what happened? And we can hold it and just fester on it and get all worked up about it all over again. That's not forgiveness, is it? We didn't really let it go. I love what the Bible says in Micah chapter 7, verses 18 and 19. It says, God is so compassionate. You know what he does with us? He takes our sin and he tramples it under his feet, and then he hurls it into the depths of the sea. And when Jesus says, you and I need to forgive, he's saying that's exactly what we need to do with each other's wrongs and hurts and offenses. I'm not out in the middle of a sea exactly, but I am in the middle of a big old lake. This is Long Lake where our cabin sits. And uh, it's about seven miles long and 150 feet deep at the deepest part. And I think that's plenty deep to demonstrate the powerful truth of what Jesus is teaching us, don't you? Can I ask you to do something? Can we get real right now? I'm going to ask you to think about a person or maybe a pain, that thing or person that you know and God knows you need to let go of, you need to forgive. Imagine you have a big old rock in your hand, just like this one's in mine. And let these rocks represent the offense, that thing that hurts, what they did that was so wrong that still hurts, that you're carrying around. And then would you be willing to invite Jesus to say, Jesus, will you help me let it go to forgive now let's remember what forgiveness is not okay forgiveness is not saying oh it doesn't matter forget about it no big deal no that's not forgiveness and neither is forgiveness pretending there are no consequences sometimes there really are someone might need to go to jail pay a price or fulfill some consequences forgiveness is is when there's a burden that someone has left with you and you're holding it. And you, instead of continuing to hold it, make a decision, a choice, that you're not going to hold it anymore. You're not going to hold it against them. You're not going to hold it at all. And there are no strings attached. You're going to let it go and hurl it into the depths of the sea. 
You see, that's why forgiveness really only takes one person. Reconciliation, that takes two. Two people coming together and agreeing that they're gonna restore the relationship. Well, sometimes that's not possible. Sometimes the other person doesn't wanna do that or they're dead or just isn't interested. That's why Romans 12, 18 says, as much as it depends upon you, seek shalom. And so forgiveness depends on one person and that's you the person who decides they're willing to afie me, let it go. Now, Louis Giglio says that forgiveness really comes down to a three-step process. Name it, shame it, and let it go. Name it, shame it, let it go. Name it, first of all, say what it is. Say it out loud, identify it. She took the money, he was unfaithful. She hurt my feelings, she overlooked me. Um, he was cruel in this way. Name it. Second, shame it. Say, that's not okay. This is how it hurt me. This is what it cost me. And that's not okay. You sinned against me. Or there's how it made me feel. You shame the sin. And then third, at the very moment when you are maybe most tempted to feel revenge, to repay evil with evil, when you are thinking about it, you've named it, you've shamed it, you've got all of that stuff built in on you, that's the very moment that Jesus says, you decide to let it go. Are you ready, finally, to do this? To obey that nudge from God that you know you're having? What's the rock in your hand? That thing that you've been carrying around it might be something from years ago when you've been carrying it. Or it might be very fresh. It might be something that's very specific, an event, an abuse, uh, a wrong that someone did to you. It might be something more general, just a vague sense of disappointment, and you need to let someone go. You need to forgive them for just the way they are and who they are. Maybe it's your wife or your husband or your son or daughter or grandkid or parent or someone from work, or in the neighborhood, or whoever and whatever it is, just like the buckets, you decide. You decide who it is you need to forgive. You decide the rock that you're carrying. And you decide you're not going to carry it anymore. And you decide that you're going to ask Jesus, Jesus, help me. Help me to let it go. God, you are so faithful. Through Jesus, you have thrown our sins into the depths of the sea, and we just ask you, will you help us now to do the same, to let go of the hurts and offenses that weigh us down? In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.